Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel tonight. We're going to worship the Lord, so why don't you stand up with us? You guys ready to sing to the Lord? All right. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of here with us tonight. Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified as we just sing to you. Lord, your promises are, um, Lord, faithful. Your word is faithful. And Lord, we just pray that you prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear your word tonight, Lord, because you, none of your word will fall or fail in any way. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that and the hope that we have because of that.
stop, you'll never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. craziness in the world around us. I'm just really thankful for that. I don't know about you guys, but um, he is. He's making a way for good things, which that is amazing, isn't it? When we look at the things that are there, I mean, it's good what God is going to do.
better word. Your blood, the measure of my worth, your blood, it's more than I need. thankful for, um, Lord, your blood and the cross of Jesus Christ and how it does speak out to us, Lord, the greatness of who you are and your great love for us. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for um, uh, your constant and um, continuous um, just working and your love for us. And as we just um, go to your word right now, we just thank you for that and how stable it is for us and how what a foundation your word is for us. And we just pray as, uh, as Pastor Mark speaks, Lord, that you just Fill the words with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to hear from you, and we thank you that you do speak through your word. And so, um, Lord, we continue that attitude of worship, just um, putting ourselves uh, before you and um, putting you in that place of priority, and especially what you say. Lord, we want to just not hear and have knowledge of your word, and that it would just be something that is on the ex eternal side of who we are, but Lord, that it would go deep into our heart and be planted like a seed that would produce fruit. And we just thank you and we praise you that you do that um, and that you're faithful to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to have Pastor Mark come up. Mark Fisher has been a pastor for a number of years now and has been ministering out in Fruita for a number of years. And so right now he is here. And so we're blessed to have him sharing on the uniqueness of Scripture 
And uh, let's just pray, uh, pray for Mark while we're here. Father, we just want to thank you for this time together tonight. We do pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us from your word. And I thank you for the gifts and talents that you've given Mark. And I pray that you would bless him and use him as a vessel of honor for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this is the second of our seven Wednesday night studies, uh, apologetics. So last week we did Attributes of God, uh, tonight the Uniqueness of Scripture. Next week, John, who's with the youth group right now, John Chambers, will be sharing on uh, sin, uh, the sinful nature of man, and God's plan of salvation. So I think I threw other, a few other things in there for John to confuse him and make him study harder because he's a young <laughs> buck and he needs it. So anyway, welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's good to be, good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for inviting me to... Uh, share you know when I first got saved back in 1983 I was 21 years old and I uh, didn't know anything about the Bible I didn't I wasn't even familiar with John 316 I thought that heaven was a matter of going to church and I hated going to church and so I was made to go to church as a child and I hated every time I went and my mom always had to buy me a caramel roll afterwards to convince me that it was worth going anyway um, the I had a, it was a very religious church when I went to religious instruction, it became very apparent that the, the reverend, who was reverend, hated me. I was the black sheep of the class, so I saw him as being like God, and so I wanted anything to do with God. Plus, I had a father who was a devout atheist, uh, and anyway, and I began living like that, but like Pastor Jeff, got, God saved me out of the world at 21, and it was a good, strong Bible teaching church, but there's one thing that they really never spent a lot of time on, and that was apologetics. And, and so um, there were many questions I had, and it was many years later when I went to Bible school. Um, yep, there we go, the PowerPoint. Many years later at Bible school, I had a class called Evidences or Apologetics. I've had a number of those. And this we're going to be looking at tonight. Oh, we're having a little maybe technical difficulties there. Is it not coming up? Hmm. Anyway, maybe we won't have to, use, if the PowerPoint doesn't come up, we'll have to use the, um, <laughs> these handouts. The problem with the handouts is when you print from a PowerPoint program, you can't tell what size font they have, so you need a microscope or a magnifying glass to read some of this. But maybe, maybe in the meantime, they'll we'll get that pulled up. Um, and so anyway, we're going to look at the evidences to the Bible's uniqueness. It is a unique, very unique book. There we go. Oh, we just lost it. <laughs> well, maybe we better pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to, to look into your word and to talk about your word and to see how unique your holy scripture is and how set apart it is. We just ask even for we come to these technical difficulties, we just pray that it would go well and it would work and that we'd be refreshed and encouraged by your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the first thing we're going to look at now in this, we'll see if this works. Uh, okay, let's try it again. Nothing. Can you, can you, can you click forward on that? You can just use that right arrow on your, on your screen. It should click it, go, go forward. Okay, we're going to look at the Bible's authority. The Bible's authority. You can go to the next one. And notice that the Bible, A, we're going to look at the Bible claims and assures us that in and of itself it is the Word of God, both Old and New Testaments. Right away, Genesis 1.1, the Bible doesn't try to persuade us that it is the Word of God. It speaks with authority. When Jesus was on this earth, did he speak with authority? He said it the way it was. And he didn't try to persuade us, this is the truth. And so it, claimed, it, it assures us of this. B, Jesus Christ himself honored the scriptures. And remember, when we're looking at evidences, we're looking at things about the Bible that makes it unique to any other book in this world or writings in this world. So Jesus Christ, he honored the scriptures and he quoted them extensively and he claimed that they could not be broken. And that's the reference there is in Matthew 5. And so anyway... 
Can we say that about any other book? Can any other book claim that? Did Jesus quote the rabbis? No, the rabbis had numerous writings about the scriptures in Jesus' time. There were the, the Midrash, the Mishnah, but Jesus didn't quote them. He quoted the Holy Scriptures. Here's a quote from Lewis Perry Schaefer in point number C. It's the Bible, listen, the Bible is not such a book a man would write if he could or could write if he would. It's, it is so unique, it does not pull any punches, as the saying goes, when it describes mankind. Does it give a beautiful history of the Jewish people? When you read the Old Testament, do you see, does it show Israel's failures? How about, how about the greatest king ever, Israel ever experienced in the Old Testament, King David? Did it make him this uh, perfect person? Oh, we saw David at his greatest, and we saw David at his worst. It is a very unique book in that sense. D, it's the comprehensive knowledge of the Bible includes science, astronomy, and history. It has been ahead of the knowledge of men. The Bible agrees with true science and archaeology. Isaiah 40, 22, what does it say? God sits upon what? Does anybody know that verse? God sits upon the circle of the earth and all of its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. So where do we find out that the earth is round? In 700 BC, the Bible reveals to us, guess what? The Bible or the world is not flat. God sits upon the circle of the earth. Okay, E, think of the ethics of the Bible is utterly different from anything in the world. It teaches the highest code of morality known to man. Compare Jesus Christ to other religious founders. Think, think of when, when the Roman Catholic Church became, if you want to say, very religious and works-oriented. The Pope became like God, did he not? And do the Pope, does the Pope have flaws? The Popes have flaws? Oh, yeah. oh my word, did they ever have flaws? And many of them had very bloody hands because they were warlike. How, how about Muhammad? He was a result of the Crusades. How about, how about Muhammad who started Islam? Was he a, a very righteous man? No. He was, he was, he was a crusader. What, what, what is a, uh, he was like a Viking. What is another word uh, that we would get for someone who goes in and uh, wants to rape and pillage other communities. A marauder? Yes, that's what he was. How about Joseph Smith? If you read about that man, you cannot believe that even one person would follow him. But when you read about Jesus Christ, he teaches the highest code of ethics or morality known to man. In the Matthew 5.28, Jesus said, If you even look upon a woman to lust after her, what have you committed in your heart? Adultery. Jesus gets right down to the core issues. And not, it's not what goes into your mouth. It, it corrupts you because that's the Jewish leaders. You can't eat that. You can't eat that. You can't touch this. It's not what goes in. It's what comes out of your mouth because what comes out of your mouth comes from what? Your heart. He gets right down to the very core of issues. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. F. The continuity of the Bible has the same message from cover to cover. There are 66 books, plus or minus 40 various authors, covering over 1,500 years, and it all agrees magnificently, beautifully. It flows from Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. You can go to the next slide. There's one central theme. It's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Someone's coming. Genesis 3.15 begins it. In the Gospels, he came, and in the epistles, he's coming again. We have H, the eternal character of the Bible. It has transformed the lives of men and women throughout all ages. How many here, like Pastor Jeff and myself, are saved out of the world? That your lives were transformed and turned around. Here's this guy, uh, like myself, hell-bent on self-destruction, I'm introduced to Jesus Christ and my, I'm miraculously saved and my parting buddies, now I'm witnessing to them, not drinking my favorite Miller Lite or Miller with them or whatever it was. Because that's what, that's what the Word of God does. It changes us. It transforms us. And only the Scriptures can do that. Only God's Holy Word can do that because the Word of God is the authority. 
The gospel is the authority, the power of God that changes lives. We think of prophecy and its precise fulfillment all point to the coming Messiah, beginning with Genesis 3.15. Psalm 22 describes the physical sufferings of, of Jesus as his bones came out of joint on the cross. David's, Dave, King David, who wrote that, was never hung on a cross. It was prophetic. How about Isaiah 53, when it describes Jesus' soul being made an offering for our sin? It's about 700 B.C. How in 714, Jesus would be born of a virgin. In, in chapter 9, it talks about who this glorious, unique person, who he would be. Oh, it's beautiful. No one else, no other book is like this. You and I, we can make predictions, right? And we can make assumptions. But can we say, declare how something is going to happen and have it exactly happen that way? Can we do that? No, we can't. And no one can. J, the Bible, the Bible is known for its literacy, literary excellence and consistency. Now, when you think, when I, when, I, when I first think of that, you know what I think of? I think of Psalm 23. I mean, even unbelievers quote Psalm 23, don't they? Because it's so beautiful. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's a, and, we, and we can picture ourselves on the side of a mountain being led by a shepherd in, near these still waters and our souls being refreshed. We, K, we think the Bible remains fresh and relevant, although written thousands of years ago. Um, Psalms, many of the Psalms are written, what, in about, around the time of David, 1,900 B.C., and here we are, was it, so it's like 3,000 years later. You ever pick up a Psalm and read it, and you think it just, it's like speaking what's on your heart, and you can identify with that, because that is, because it is alive and powerful, and it is very relevant and we've come to L. Through the years, no other book has stood so well against the attacks of the atheists. Everybody is trying to tear the Bible apart. Oh, it's in, you know, they say the Bible has, um, uh, there's so many inconsistencies or uh, it, it, it contradicts itself. And when somebody usually tells me that in the defense of the faith, when somebody says, oh, the Bible contradicts itself, how can you believe it? Oh, I, I do what Jesus does. I ask the next, I, Jesus, Jesus often answered a question with a question. The question is, well, show me, show me its inconsistencies and show me where it contradicts itself. Would you please? Uh, well, I just heard it from someone. Oh, so you believe you believed something without exploring it and looking at it yourself. We're going to talk a little bit about some, of what, some seeming contradictions in a little while. You can go to the next slide. Now, know this. It says, knowing this that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Interpretation means origin. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved along or moved by the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit was involved in the writing of the scriptures. T Second Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word inspiration, does anybody know what that word means? God breathed, right? Now, I'm going to, I want you to try to say something without breathing out. The idea is, think, put your hand up to your mouth, and when you talk, what's happening? Are you breathing out? Yes, you're breathing out. You can't make noise. You can't speak without breathing out. And so the idea of being God breathed is come forth from God himself. And it's holy men of God, men that God used. And matter of fact, there was an unholy man in the Old Testament we know about that God spoke through in his name. You, I think you brought him up as Balaam. God is so powerful, he can make an unbelieving prophet speak the word of God. <laughs> That's what he does. Next so some more unique facts. Author claims to be God, including Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ spoke with that same authority. Again, we looked at it as written over about 1,500 years, beginning with Moses. Um, we, it's about 40 various authors. We're not sure, like the book of Hebrews who wrote that. There's opinions, and they're from many backgrounds. When you th what was Elisha doing when, when Elijah came along? Does anybody know? Was he working out in the... 
Yeah, he was working outside. How, what, were, what were Peter, James, and John doing? And Andrew? They were fishing. They were working their nets. They were fishermen. How about Matthew? Yeah, Matthew the tax collector. Yeah, and you know what's really, and it's really unique about this is we see the personalities. God doesn't wipe away the personality of the writer. Did you realize Matthew, who's, his gospel is called the Gospel par excellence? And he wrote the first gospel, and there's a reason it was put number one in the New Testament. is because at the time it was looked at as being the greatest because um, it was an early gospel. Matthew was a disciple, and he declared a lot of things about Jesus Christ. But you know what's fascinating about the gospel of Matthew? It uses a lot of, he's a tax collector, and he, count, he does a lot of, he's an accountant, so he does a lot of using what? Numbers. So guess what you have? In the Gospel of Matthew, you have a lot of numbers. How about this? When he, record, he records a lot about Jesus bashing the Pharisees. Do you realize, is it Matthew 22 or 23, 23? The whole chapter is given over to bashing the Pharisees. A whole chapter is given to just to slamming the Pharisees. Why is that? Because Matthew, as a tax collector in the Jewish culture in that day, was looked at as being a traitor to his people. He worked for Rome, and he took money from the Jews. And a tax collector was on the same level as... ...a recipient, guess what, of a lot of what? Criticism, bigotry, prejudice, because he was the scum of the earth among the Pharisees. And remember, the Pharisees had control of the people. They were the top dogs. And so you see Matthew's personality written in the book. And you see that throughout Jesus was Jewish. And oh my, do you see his Jewishness come out. Jew, the Jewish people are known for being very abrupt. They're sometimes not known for their politeness. There can be very much in your face. And do you see, how, do, how does Jesus talk to the Pharisees? Can, can we just sit down and counsel about this? I think it'd be good just to talk about this. No, you're of your father the devil, and the works of your father that you do. He, you, we see even the personality of, of the Jewish people in Jesus, because he was Jewish in every way. And, and so it's just it's very fascinating, even though it's, it's God's holy word, yet he doesn't remove the personality from it, nor the people's personalities. You know, it was once said, James, the gospel reached James' head, okay? And when you read the gospel, or the, excuse me, the epistle of James, you see James' Jewish personality in it strongly. And then it says, but the gospel, it says, reached his head. He sort of stayed in Jerusalem, and didn't travel much of anywhere. Then there's Peter that said the gospel reached his head. It reached his heart. We see him going to Cornelius. We see him reaching out to Gentiles. And yet we see him compromising the book of Galatians from the pressure from the Jews that were from James. Then they said, then there's Paul. It says the, Paul, the gospel reached Paul's head. It reached his heart and it reached his feet. And so when we read the epistles of Paul, we see him giving his life for the Gentile people. We see his calling is very clear in those. And so anyway, we have 40, 40 various authors from many different backgrounds. Um, it's written in three different languages, uh, Hebrew, some uh, Aramaic, and the uh, Koine Greek of the New Testament. Um, portions have been translated into over 33 hundred languages. The New Testament has a little over 1,500 languages has been translated into, and Old and New Testament, nearly 700. And I think there's a little under, what, 7,000 languages in the world. Speaking of the Tower of Babel, there's proof in itself, right? Another evidence that the Bible, when it comes to history, is accurate. Okay, next one. Um, it focuses on reality, not fantasy. Um, if that, there's, has anybody ever wondered why the apocalyptic books were never accepted in the canon, the, new, the canon of Scripture? Is because those, and then even especially the Gnostic Gospels that, were, that came out, were very fanciful. 
they, ha- they have stories that just are, you can tell that are made up. They're like fables, especially the Gnostic Gospels. And that is why they were rejected. And in around 390, 397, somewhere in there, finally the 27 New Testament books were finalized. This is what belongs in the canon. And they realized that when Paul wrote, Peter wrote, that he wrote to real people, real situations, real circumstances, real people. They're not fakes. Somebody would write a fake gospel or a fake epistle, and they would sign someone's name to it, trying to add authority. And those mainly were the Gnostic Gospels. And so the New Testament canon, Old Testament, it focuses on reality, not fantasy. And it presents a clear theme from cover to cover. It has the reasons for sin, suffering, and salvation. Does anybody else, does anybody else tell me why is it going on? Why is this happening? I talked to uh, an atheist the other day, a devout evolutionist. And this person said, um, I, I've been very hopeful all of my life because they really think mankind is evolving and getting better. And for the fir- they said for the very first time, they've become a pessimist because they don't see things getting better. Well, if you know your Bible, history just re- repeats itself, right? Because in our nature, what are we by nature? Sinners, we are not evolving. If anything, we're devolving as we get further from Adam or really maybe Noah and his family. But it has the, that's what it has the reasons for. Then the big three questions. Why, where did I come from? The Bible answers, where did I come from? You read that in Genesis. Why am I here? And where am I going? Those are the big three questions in life. And humanism and mankind, even religions, try to answer them. You know, if you're, if you're a Muslim and you, you, you give yourself, you die as a martyr, maybe you'll get, how many is it, 70 virgins in eternity? And the same thing with Mormonism. Where do they get those fanciful ideas? Where do they come from? Well, we know where they come from. They come from the great liar himself. But anyway, and it reveals to man the simple plan of salvation. And this is what caught my eye. I thought I had to go to church. Man, if I had to go to church to be a Christian, I guess I'm not going to become one. But when I was told it's not a matter of church, it's a matter of Jesus. And it offers a free salvation to all people despite your race, your color, where you're from. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all because God loved the world. And that includes everyone. You can go on the next one. as Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last and there's no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. In other words, whether he goes, you look backward or you look forward, can anybody be like me and tell you why we're here and where we're going. Why we've come to this place and where we're going from here. And God can declare in detail what's going to happen. Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin will conceive, she'll bear a son. I mean, that is precise. Unbelievable. Really believable. Because it's God's word, right? And when Jesus was speaking of future events, be, he, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He's making himself God with that statement, is he not? He's declaring what the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, declared. Because he is Jehovah. And Jesus said, what I've just told you, he's talking about the coming events, the second coming, the restoration of all things, that new heavens and a new earth. He said, it will happen. It's guaranteed. Because he's God, and that's the authority of his word. And that is how perfect his word is. Now, you can go to the next one. And we, now we come to the Bible's organization. This, it, this is very important to understand. Um, the Old and New Testaments, okay? And we're going to go, in, first of all, look at, at things in general. So you can go to the next frame. There you go. We have the Old Testament focus. It's Messiah and his nation, Israel. So we have 
the first books, the Pentateuch, or the, or the Torah, the Jews call it the books of Moses, that talks about creation, the call of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenants that God made. You're going through uh, Genesis right now. And we have those first books that Moses wrote. Then we have the books of history. Um, we have the history of Israel's life and journeys and their covenant life with God. Can anybody think of an Old Testament book of history? Yeah, Joshua. How about First and Second Chronicles? Those are historical books that tell us the story of what God is doing with his people. Then we have the books of poetry. What is the book of poetry? Psalms. Psalms. Actually, I think Job is considered a book of poetry as well. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And these, and these were written during Israel's history. And so, there, and so when, we look at, when we look at this, and this is what's confusing with someone who picks up a Bible for the first time. Not everything is in chronological order. And you can, can get chronological Bibles. And so it's very confusing when you pick some of these things up and, and you're just beginning looking. So that's how it's, these are broken down. So we have the books of poetry. Then we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. And you think, how do they get the name major and minor? It only has to do with the size of the book. You think of Isaiah as a major prophet. Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament because it is pregnant with prophecy about the Messiah and what he was going to do in this earth. And, and so we have then the minor prophets. Um, can somebody name a minor prophet? Hosea. How about, what's the last book? <laughs> there you go. And so those are, those are the minor prophets because they're relatively small. And yet, they're yet they have a lot of prophecy in them speaking of Israel. And some of these were written, some of the later prophets, the later prophets, the close to the coming of Christ, when we see Israel turning her back more and more before we call it the intertestamental period, when there was no writing going on for about 400 years, we see God's judgment coming strong on Israel and Judah. And yet we see greater promises about the coming Messiah. As Israel's failure gets stronger, God's promises get greater. That's encouraging, isn't it? When Israel is in the midst of sin is when God gives these great prophetic promises to give hope to the people believing His Word. And yet in the midst of these, uh, we, read, we read some of these prophets and we're impressed with them. How about Jeremiah? A young man who, who was going to be used greatly to challenge his people. How would you like to be, uh, you know, be living knowing that God says, you're going to preach your heart out and they're going to reject you anyway. <laughs> they're not going to like you. They're not going to like what you say. They're going to want to throw you out and get rid of you. They're going to want to kill you. But here's your job. Go and do it. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> well, at least God told them ahead of time what was coming, right? He was, okay. Um, and, and so we see, we see Isaiah himself. What did, what did, what did, uh, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, right? And in Isaiah, we see a unique book there, as I already said. It, it's just so full of, of just prophecy. And chapters 40 through the end get, become very, very full of this idea of this perfect servant. Do you realize Messiah is also called a servant? Those are called the servant chapters in Isaiah. God would have a perfect servant who would not be like Israel, his failing servant. Jesus would be the servant that would fulfill his father's will perfectly. And that's, we, we go to the Old Testament, we read this, we're excited and we're encouraged. Now in the New Testament, we have the Gospels. And those are the first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's first coming and the perfect life of Messiah, and it culminates with what? Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his command. And this is interesting. His command to do what? Don't stay in Israel. Because this message is not just for Israel, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. Go into all the world and proclaim this good news. That Jesus Christ didn't come just to die 
for the Jewish people. He came to die for the world, His creation. And you know where we find that, where that all, there's all kinds of hints of that? It is in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49. God says, it's, it's not going to be enough for my Messiah to restore Israel, but I want to give my servant to be a light to the nations. Then in Acts 13, Paul quotes that very verse and says, I am called to be a light to the nations. And so Paul is our apostle. We are to be what? Lights to the nations. That's why we travel to India, Africa, here, because we want to radiate the love of Christ to a lost world. And, and we, we find that um, the Messiah lives this perfect life, and yet even in, the, even in the Gospels, they're different. Matthew is this very Jewish. That's why when I first picked up Matthew, it was like, oh, I couldn't figure out anything. And so fortunately, when I was in school, I had some classes on Jewish history, and it helped greatly understanding Matthew. Mark is a very fast-moving book, believed written to the Roman people who didn't want a lot of detail but wanted action. And then there's Luke, which is a very concise history. He's a doctor, very precise. And then there's the Gospel of John. And John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's is a different Gospel. It's, it's very simple, but it's very deep. And it's written much later. And it's dealing with correcting ideas that were beginning to seep into the church from Gnostic tendencies the teaching of false teachings about Jesus, that he was not God, that Jesus was just a phantom and he appeared to die, but he didn't. And all these fanciful ideas are coming up denying the resurrection. And that's why John says, if you deny, in 1 John, if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you are not of God. If you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, you're wrong. Because he's, he's taking on these false teachings about Jesus. John walked with him. John knew that he was the Son of God. John saw him raise the dead. John witnessed him after he was raised from the dead. And he would clearly declare that. Then we have Acts. Acts is a book of history. It shows us the establishment and transition of the early church, how it came about. Peter being very prominent in the first few chapters, and then it becomes all about Paul and the gospel going to the nations. Then we have Paul's epistles. Remember, this is the organization of the Testaments. They're not in chronological order. They're, they're categorized. And so thirdly, we come, to, we come to Paul's epistles. And what is the first one of Paul's epistles? Romans. And what's the last of Paul's epistles? It's the one he wrote before, before he died. Second, T Timothy. So those are Paul's epistles. And then we have the general epistles. Who, who wrote some of the general epistles? James. Yep, James, Peter, Jude. And we still don't know who wrote Hebrews. In heaven we'll know one day. But every scholar has their opinion on who wrote that. And then last of all, we have Revelation, which is mainly prophecy focusing on the second coming of Christ and the, really the completion and the fulfillment of all prophecy. Because there's a lot of prophecy that is not yet fulfilled, is there not? Yeah, there's a lot of prophecy that needs to be fulfilled yet, and we're waiting for that with Jesus' second coming. You can go to the next one. The Bible's key theme and message from cover to cover, it is a single person. You can go to the next one. Jesus, it says, Then he said to them as he's on the road to Emmaus, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding and they might comprehend the scriptures. Now it's interesting what Jesus does here. When Jesus says, I need to fulfill all that's written in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, he is, he is calling, that's the Old Testament. Okay? That would be their three categories of the Old Testament. The books of Moses, that's the law, not the Mosaic law, but the law in general, the books of Moses. We have the, 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 uh, the, the Psalms. We have the books, those writings. And we also have the, the prophets, all speaking of Jesus. Then he said to them, thus it, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance 
and remission of sins should be preached in His name to who? All nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. Who is the theme of Scripture? It is Jesus Christ. And it's, it's not Israel. It's not the church. It is a person. It's Jesus Christ. Israel is His called nation. The church belongs to Him. It is His building program. Go ahead, next one. Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And they which testify of me. And he says, you, you search the scriptures and they were diligent students. He says, but in them, you, you think you're going to have somehow have a sense of eternity, what eternal life is, but it's, it's, it's not about things. It's about me. If you really read the prophecies, you'd read about this servant. If you read the Psalms, you'd read about this king descending from David, the lineage of David. Now, in this, we have this message, the uniqueness of biblical salvation. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Pastor Jeff does a marvelous job sharing the gospel every single Sunday. And I, and I thank you for that. I appreciate that. Because that is what saves. And we need to be reminded, it is not limited to nationality or number. It is void of human merit. It is fully dependent on the work of another. It states that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. One must receive Jesus Christ by faith. Salvation is guaranteed since Christ did all the work. It's, it's really simple faith in a risen Savior. It is simple. That is why the gospel, what does gospel mean? That's why it's good news. Can you imagine? You know, if, do you want to go to heaven? Okay, you got to come to church every Sunday. We have these, uh, we call them, uh, if you, you don't do the nasty nine or the dirty dozen, if you stay away from those sins, you might make it. But since you're working and since you're using your own strength, you're never, you'll never be sure. But do the best you can and maybe. That's what religion offers. But the Bible guarantees eternal life in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. You go next one. I love this in Titus. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteous, righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Who did all the work? You know what? Guess who does the sealing? The Holy Spirit. We share the gospel. The Holy Spirit seals the deal. The person believes. The Holy Spirit seals them. Next one. This leads, this leads to something. Now, this is our last section we're going to look at. The New Covenant. Distinctions between the Old and New Testaments. This folks, is extremely important. The Old Testament is mainly about who again? Israel. The New Testament is about the church. Now, I have a question for you. Sort of a trick question. When did the New Testament begin? No, don't have to answer. Just so you think. When did the New Testament begin? With Matthew 1.1? Or... Or at Calvary. Okay? This is very important to understand. This is something that was not taught to me. And so the church I grew up in was mixing some Old Testament, New Testament teaching. It picked from stuff from stuff directly to Israel and mixed it with stuff in the New Testament. And it became a mess and confusing. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, okay? The distinctions between the Old and New Testament. Testament. So keep that in mind. When did it begin? Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And remember the word testament means covenant. Or did it begin at Calvary? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, the Old Testament. What, what really, let's look and see what it says in the Old Testament. David had to pray this in Psalm 51 after he committed the sin uh, with Bathsheba, the, uh, the murder of her husband. He went before the Lord and he said, do not cast me away from your presence 
and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Why did he have to pray that? Because in 1 Samuel 16, 14, because of Saul's rebellion, it says, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Hmm. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came and went upon men and women. Now let's look at the New Testament. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is our down payment for our salvation. Notice, when I was in Africa my very first time, and actually not Africa, but Kenya my very first time, I spoke on this because they have had a lot of teaching from the Old Testament. They apply to themselves and one of them being a works-based keeping of your salvation. And they would pray this prayer, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. If you disobey, you'll lose your salvation, and God will leave you because, guess what? If the Holy Spirit leaves you, that means you're not God's temple anymore, and guess what? It means you've lost. You lost your salvation. So I explained this to them, and when we came to these truths, you, they were cheering and and hooraying and clapping out for Jesus because they were under bondage, thinking that if I sin, I would lose the Holy Spirit. But what does that say? We were sealed. That's God's seal. And it is a guarantee of the redemption of me, of you. Okay, so anyway, now what is the difference between Psalm 51 and the verses from Ephesians? What is the difference? They're on different sides of the cross. Okay? They're on different sides of the cross. Okay? Next one. So we have conditional. Go ahead and press it again. An unconditional. What does it mean by conditional? If you do what's right, the outcome is good. Unconditional is, guess what? Even if you sin, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit, but you're going to still be sealed because it's unconditional. It's not based on your works. It's not based on your performance. It's based on you accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you're sealed for eternity. Okay, next one. So we have, the okay, go ahead, Old Testament. Now, it says in verse Matthew 6, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Next one. Okay. What does Paul say? Paul says, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving each other just as the Lord forgave you. What is the difference? Now, I ask the pastors this in Africa. Who's right and who's wrong? And they all looked at us and said, Paul's right. You're saying Jesus is wrong? No. This is, now, this is a seeming contradiction, right? Go ahead. One is conditional and the other unconditional. It, Jesus isn't lying here. He says, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of yours. Is Jesus lying? No. No. Jesus is still teaching under what? Good. uh, You're right. Yeah, the Old Testament, right? Because back in the book of Deuteronomy, when God gives the law, God gives the ifs. If you obey my voice, you will be blessed. If you disobey my voice, you will be what? Cursed. It's the ifs. They're conditional. The Mosaic law was a conditional covenant. And Jesus is just reiterating and adding to it, showing the Jewish people what sinners they were. Because probably almost every Pharisee would look at this, and if they were honest, there were somebody they were not forgiving. And Jesus used the law beautifully to show mankind that, whoa, I need forgiveness then. I need something. I need salvation. 
And so Paul, so the idea is here, neither is wrong. Neither, Jesus is right, Paul's right. What is the difference? They're on just different sides of the cross. There are different sides of the cross. Next one. Now, in the Old Testament, notice this is the difference. Old Testament, focus was on a what? Earthly kingdom. Go into the land. Go into the land of Canaan. Every place, Joshua, you put your soul, your foot, will belong to you, Israel. It promised earthly prosperity. It promised earthly power. They would be free from their enemies around them if they followed God. They had physical worship. They had the the, uh, tabernacle for a period of time. Then Saul built the temple and they worshiped at the temple. There was one temple. God promised them a physical peace from their enemies if they followed him. He promised physical victory. But we must remember, I was probably taught this probably in, in grade one. The Old Testament is for our learning, but it's not written what? Directly to us. Have you ever, you ever heard that before? Is this that new? I'll give you an example why. There was a ship that had to land on Cape Horn in Africa. And it had Dutch Christians, reformers in it. And they were sailors. And because the storms are so bad, they had to seek a haven. And they found out there is a beautiful land down there. And because they think that the Old Testament is theirs and they're Israel, they decide to start bringing all hordes of people being persecuted and from Holland in these places down to Cape Horn to South Africa. And they said, this is our promised land. As the Israelites drove out the Canaanites, we're going to drive out the inhabitants of South Africa. And therefore, it justified the killing of Africans, the enslaving of Africans, and the pushing out of their own lands. Because South Africa was their promised land. Because guess what testament they were living in? They were taking their marching orders from what testament? The Old Testament. Our marching orders come from the New Testament, but we use the Old Testament. Why? Because it's beautiful. History, right? The history of man, the history of Israel, the prophecies regarding Christ, but there are specific marching orders given to Israel and Israel alone. In the New Testament, what are we promised? A heavenly kingdom, right? We're we're promised heavenly treasure. We're promised spiritual power. Actually, Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. You're not going to have peace. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It's a a spiritual sacrifice that the New Testament teaches us. Guess what, folks? There are many temples. Each individual who has the Holy Spirit has the God's Shekinah glory dwelling in in them and the Holy Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are the temple of God. And there's just not one place of worship in Jerusalem and Israel. We can worship anywhere where two or three are gathered in his name. Warfare, yet we're promised inner peace, spiritual warfare. We're going to have spiritual victory because Jesus overcame the grave. And the New Testament was for our learning and written directly to us. That is why Jesus taught new things. You know, not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. When your enemy slaps you, what does he say? Turn the other cheek and do good to those who hate you. David in the Psalms, you know what he prayed? Lord, make my enemies fatherless. I mean, yeah, make my enemies' children fatherless. In other words, kill my enemies. Are we told to pray that in the New Testament? We're told to what? Pray for our enemies and do good towards them because we're heaping coals of fire upon their head and God can use that. Go ahead to the next one. Notice this. Leviticus 19.18 and this actually is quoted by Paul like in the book of Romans. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of uh, of your people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. What is the standard of that love? What is the basis of that love? 
Yourself, right? So what if you don't like yourself very much? Do you know why there's some mean people out there? Because they don't like themselves. And they're just showing the same thing to others that's what's going on in their heart. That is the standard. And that is a standard. But notice what Jesus says in John. A new commandment I give to you. How can Jesus say, I give you a new commandment? How can he do that? Because he's who? He's God. And it's a new covenant now. He says, I give you that you love one another. How much? This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. What is the standard of that love? As Pastor Jeff's been talking about. Agape love, right? A sacrificial love where you'll give your life. Not one to take life. You'll give your life. Is that a higher standard of love? Because we are in the new covenant. In the new covenant. And, that, and so what is the difference? Again, what is the difference? If I was going to ask a question, when do you think the new covenant started? Matthew 1.1? 1, 1, or do you think it started at Calvary? Calvary. The cross. Think about it that way. Different sides of the cross. Jesus says, I give you a new command. Not only that, he says, I want you not to stay in Jerusalem. I want you to go out and proclaim to the world. Where the Old Testament focused on the Jewish nation, and now God is focusing on the world, that the world through Jesus might be saved. Go ahead and go to the last one. But now, oh, it's hard to see. That is purple with gold outline. Does anybody know there's a hidden message there? Does anyone know what that is? What colors purple and gold goes with, go with who? Purple and gold go with what team? I'm from Minnesota. Vikings, oh yeah. There's a, a subliminal message here. Vikings, Vikings. My hope is not in the Vikings. I learned that long ago. I don't know if my kids have learned it yet, but they're learning it. But now we have been delivered from the law. Because the law condemns sin. The law was holy, just, and good, and it condemns sinners. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in what? Newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Why? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that your word that you've given to us is beautiful. It's unique. There's no other book like it. Thank you. I just want to thank you that we live on this side of the cross. We live on the side where Jesus has won the victory already for us. Thank you that the message that we get to proclaim is for the world. And it does not matter to who because you love the world and you gave yourself for the world. Thank you that you're reconciling the world to yourself. May we have greater confidence in your word as we go through this series in apologetics. May we have greater confidence in your word, confidence in who you are, knowing that the scriptures that we read, that we pray over, and that we memorize and study is perfect. And it converts us and it changes us. And thank you for the privilege of gazing upon Jesus Christ and having the Holy Spirit within us change us from the inside as from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and close with the song. Thanks, Mark.
isn't he and we'll trust the lord in all that he has pray that you have a blessed week this week and that the lord will just guide and direct you by his word and his spirit all right if you have any prayer or if you have any needs uh you can come up and i'm sure jeff will be up here to pray with you or pastor mark all right have a great week